GM, G Eigen, G Hyperlane, and G Modular. What's up, John? Welcome back. You're no stranger to the show. Welcome to Eigenlayer Unlocked, an interactive educational journey through the Eigenlayer ecosystem created by technical founders and builders for the entire crypto community. A special thank you to our partners, All Layer, Polymer, Authentic, Skate, and Lagrange for helping to make this happen. Our goal is to raise the collective knowledge of the Eigenlayer AVS ecosystem and unpack the technical designs of the top teams in space. Welcome to Eigenlayer Unlocked. GM, G Eigen, G Hyperlane, and G Modular. What's up, John? Welcome back. J. Cole on the show. Thank you for joining us again this time for a Modular Eigenlayer presentation. Um, you're no stranger to the show, so I think, uh, I think everyone here, here knows you here. And uh, yeah, man, you guys have had a, a bunch of like really exciting developments coming out of the out of the woodwork here. And uh, one of the modular teams that are shipping day in and day out. So kudos on all the latest shipments. And uh, very excited to dig into uh, some of those that are uh, most recent and most exciting. Um, and again, thank you for coming on the show again. It's always a pleasure. No, always, always happy to be here. I think we're going to have, uh, you know, a fun time today. What I'll say before we get started is, um, you know, I'm going to be a little bit uh, more loose, less sharp, and less crisp than, uh, you know, maybe folks on the show are used to. Think of it like, uh, so I'm a big, big fan of stand-up and, you know, like the best comedians when they go on their tour, the uh, first few stops... They're like testing out the new material. They're seeing what hits, what works. It's going to be a little bit like that today. Uh, so we're going to get to it. And before we dive in, I'm going to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to keep it simple. And so to start, we're going to be touched briefly on what's already been built and what you can do with what's already been built. Then we're going to talk about why it matters. Now, if this was a pitch deck, right? If it were like a you know a venture a team trying out there to, to raise uh, venture money, think of this as being like the problem section. Now, I know most people like to open with their problem section, and you know that's cool. Not one of those people. I like to open by telling you what is the thing that's happening here as a brief introduction, and then build a foundation uh, of what the problem is, and then go back to how that problem is being addressed in more depth. Once we've covered the problem, we're going to get into what's coming next, how it relates to those problems specifically, and how it builds on what already is there, and most importantly, what you're going to be able to do with it. So it's on now. So today, we're going to be talking about an open framework for interoperability. Like, what does that even mean, right? Well, there's numerous ways today to go about interoperability, about connecting chains, but there aren't many ways to do it with an open framework. Now, in fact, I'd say that there are really two open frameworks for interoperability, the first being IBC and the second being Hyperlane. And guess what? Today, we're going to be talking about Hyperlane. So earlier, I told you we're going to start by talking about what's already been built. So uh, as a brief on Hyperlane and what exists today, to really better understand everything I'm going to be telling you today, let me also give you some insight into how we view the world. Really think of this as like, this is our point of view. So before we ever started building Hyperlane, before we even started thinking about what will eventually become Hyperlane, we, you know, my co-founder and I really believed firmly that if crypto was going to scale, if it was going to serve an internet scale of demand through blockchains, we're going to need to horizontally scale, right? Like the internet doesn't run on one gigantic server that's like underground somewhere, despite there's like a great South Park episode where everything is basically in an underground server somewhere. Well, then in reality, it's not built like that. It's like an ungodly large number of servers distributed all over the world. And our view is that blockchains will scale um, horizontally in a similar way. Now, the audience may know this as the modular thesis, right? Ethereum's roll-up roadmap, call it whatever you want. But we believed firmly that this is the way that things are going to pan out as far back as three, four years ago. And this high conviction view that there has to be an increasingly large number of chains, that view is the basis for every decision we've been making in building Hyperlane. Right? So a world with an increasingly large number of chains, with an accelerated number of chains, 
must have a permissionless and scalable form of interoperability to connect those chains, to make sense of all those chains. We got to have a way for anyone to connect any chain. And certainly to do that, you need an open source framework. And that's why we built and build Hyperlane as the open framework for interoperability. So I'm going to move to the next one. I just told you, letting anyone connect any chain. Well, it sounds kind of simple, but it's obviously much harder than it looks. But today, anyone who's watching us right now, anyone can go to the Hyperlane docs, they can download the CLI, and they can get started deploying Hyperlane to any chain and then get that chain connected with any other that already has Hyperlane, right? So like, let's see if the rollup decides to launch its own rollup today, you can do this with Hyperlane. But I would say that this really, it's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. You know, if you take a step, take it a step further, you get what I like to call an interop, an interop zone or, you know, maybe a trade alliance, like bear with me on this for a little bit because we haven't settled on naming here. So it's all a work on progress. This is part of that like material testing element. But once you develop that capability of letting anyone connect any chain, the really cool thing you can do with it is not just these, you know, these one-off connections. It's much more than that. It's this, it's this idea of a sort of interop zone. You know, you keep hearing about all these ecosystems and, you know, they're like, we're all going to have our own native form of interoperability, right? But I would say outside of Polygon, I don't know of anyone that's actually delivered um, on this so far, right? It's, you know, it's true that they all say it and that's amazing. And we know that uh, these people are hard at work at it, but nothing's there yet. Well, today, already today with Hyperlane, this can be done for any ecosystem. And in just a second, we're going to talk about one of the first cases of this happening. So, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you're at one of these places, I'd say don't spend all the bandwidth, all the resources spinning your wheels here. Just use Hyperlane. And so Superlane, you may have seen this come out um, in the past week. Superlane is a collaboration between Velodrome, which uh, for those who happen to be unfamiliar, one of the largest apps in the Optimism ecosystem and certainly one of the largest DEXs. So this is the first such interop zone. And we're going to dive much deeper into this specifically in just a few minutes. Uh, and really everything else that I've said, but uh, this should be moving into production in the next few weeks. And this is an effort that was really spearheaded by the Velodrome team. In fact, they did so much of it already before even bringing it up to us. And they were only able to do that because Hyperlane is, as I've been saying, right, an open framework. Like I really can't think of any other uh, tool in the interoperability landscape that would allow them to do this. And with Hyperlane, they were able to go kind of from zero to 100 really so quickly. You know, they've only been working with Hyperlane for like a couple of months. So it's kind of bonkers to even think about it. But the brief on Superlane, what is it? It's a distinct security zone with distinct validators that can and will serve any and all interested members uh, of the Superchain Alliance. And in my view, it's going to be something that is a precursor to the superchain native form of interoperability. So earlier, I told you I like to lay out what the thing is in a simple way and then get into the problem and kind of explain why it matters. So we're going to do that. So why does it matter? You know, you could look at this very compelling uh, stock photo here <laughs> that I found of a man pondering. That was the the search that I had. So you must be pondering as well, like what's going on? So let me tell you why it matters. So beyond the obvious that we covered earlier when I was talking about the uh, point of view that we have here, the point of view that informs everything we do, it's pretty clear now to any uh, astute observer that the industry is moving at a breakneck pace. And not only is the number of chains uh, increasing, the number of chain architectures uh, that are being used, that are being adapted, that's also increasing, right? Just in the role of space, right? Go back 18 months, go back 24 months, you know, two years, you really, you had only OP stack uh, to begin with, and then quickly, right? Like this OP stack that was really just like an EVM extension. Now you got 
just within EVM rollups, like multiple distinct stacks. You got OP, you got Orbit, you got ZK Sync, you got Polygon CDK, and I'm sure that I'm even missing some, right? Add on to that, you're also seeing an increased amount of SVM-based rollups, right? Like Hyperlane just launched with Eclipse, the, I want to say, the, really the first uh, SVM-based rollup. And what I can tell you is that what we see from the folks we work with, that there is now even divergence in the architectures in SVM, just as we saw within the EVM, right? Like this is happening there too. And we haven't even gotten to, right, the, the fact that beyond that, you have other VMs like Move, like Telegram, Cosmos, Near, that list goes on. And I think, of course, you're going to see VM diver, uh, you know, like stack divergence, architecture divergence there. And, you know, like a great example of this is I'm sure over the course of the show, you've talked about things like Move, like Inisha. And now imagine having to manage all that complexity just because you want to access like more than a handful of chains. Like, come on now, right? That's just not manageable. But there's more right now. In the current day, even the interoperability you do have between these rollups, it's, it's pretty sparse. Like it's so often that we talk to folks who you would really think like have this all covered, have this all figured out. And they're like, Shit, man, like, no, we, we have no easy way to connect between our chain and this, like, big other chain that you've definitely heard of. And I'm like, no, no way. And they're like, no way. Yeah, for sure. It's, and it is um, somewhat dumbfounding that it's still the case in, you know, the year of our Lord, 2024, soon to be 2025, but it seems to be true. And there's even more. The last few things I'd say here in terms of why this matters, why the problem that this open framework is, was, and will be meant to tackle uh, are quite relevant. Well, first, because more often than not, basically everywhere outside of IBC, interoperability is still to this day pretty permission. You know, like it's gate kept. You got to talk to somebody and then they got to do something and they maybe even have to talk to another somebody and like, why do we get into crypto, right? I don't have to talk to anybody before I just develop an app and, and build it and launch it on Ethereum. I don't have to talk to anybody before I do that with Solana, with any uh, public blockchain. Like, why is it here that I have to do that? It's not a choice. I just kind of have to. Now say you're like, you know what? I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm going to do it all myself. Well, good luck to you. Because now you're looking at spending an ungodly amount of your resources just to try and build an interop scratch uh, interop stack from scratch and by the way that's not even something that it relates remotely to your value prop to the things that are in the realm of your core competence right why should you as a startup as a organization with very finite very limited resources why should you do that and like trust me it sucks to build an interop stack from scratch. Like I know, because we've had to do it, right? And of course, last but not least, you know, you did all that work, you got it all done, you put in that resources. Well, now that the software is done, well, now you gotta wrangle up a group of operators and you gotta get them to come power this thing that you built. And that is of course, no fun. And so that's where something like Hyperlane, right? This notion of an open framework for interoperability comes in. So what we're gonna go on now is more so than what we've talked about uh, to this point is why an open framework like Hyperlane addresses these problems that we just covered. I think the first thing I mentioned, right? That this industry moves at uh, a breakneck pace in which there is an increasingly rapid adoption of multiple chains, multiple architectures, multiple stacks. Now you're, you're just a developer out there. It's, it's been made so easy for you to launch a chain. So you go ahead and you do that. And you just wanted to be able to connect with all these new ecosystems or maybe you're not, you're not a, someone who's building a chain. You're an app builder. You're an app builder who is really like an asset issuer where your product is a token like say you're a stable coin you're an lrt an lst what do you do how do you deal 
with a problem like this? And how do you take on all that complexity without going insane and really running out of resources, which is, of course, the death of your operation? Well, Hyperlane, this open framework, it gives you a singular, consistent interface for all of your interoperability needs. That interface stays the same, but you, you keep expanding. So you just saved a tremendous amount of development time. And now when you need to expand the new chains, either this interface, this Hyperlane thing, it's either already there. Today, Hyperlane's on, you know, I want to say already over or close to uh, 80 different mainnets, and that number is going to keep uh, rising. But say it wasn't there, by some odd twist of fate, no one's done it yet. You can do that yourself because like we talked about before, anyone can go on the uh, Hyperlane docs, download that CLI and get going. And now switch the slide, but the diagram is still there. You look at this beautiful diagram. You'll see that the last step here, or I guess the penultimate step, step number five, is the interchain security module. So I'll tell you, I don't think it really would be an open framework if you were forced to settle for something, if you were forced to just accept something as is, if you couldn't uh, wrangle it, change it, customize it to your needs and wants, right? That is what makes a framework a framework. And to me, this piece, the, the security module piece, that to me is where the magic of something like Hyperlane is really born out of. It's the flexibility, it's the control that you can have over what is an integral part of the interoperability stack, of course, security. So I'd say usually for most people, bridging for their chain or app means inherently developing a material, a massive dependency on a third party and really trusting that third party. Now imagine you're one of those asset issuers that I was talking about, right? You're literally explicitly putting your entire business, your entire product in the hands of a third party. And some people totally okay with that in some settings. At some point, the stakes get so high that it starts being a little bit uh, off-putting. And so should you do that? Well, I'd say not today. Now with the open framework, right? Hyperlane lets you, the integrator, whether you're a chain, you're an app, somebody's neighbor, whoever you are, it lets you dictate what that security should be. So in ISM, right, this interchange security module, it can be anything that provides a state attestation or a state proof. So think of it, uh, you know, as ranging from as simple as like, hey, you know, using some, you know, signatures from like a validator, some state attestation, right, all the way to as complex and amazing as some form of ZK magic. You can even use multiple security modules and stack them together in aggregate. You can use just one. Now, best of all, you never need to depend on any default settings. You can use Hyperlane without ever using a module that's being run by anyone other than you. That to me is what it means to be an open framework, right? You take it, you run it, you own it, you operate it. If you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, having that flexibility. I kind of liken it to why do crypto companies, especially the ones who hold our funds in custody, why do they many times operate very differently from the financial institutions that we're used to, from say banks, right? Wells Fargo treats me a certain way because Wells Fargo kind of knows that I don't really have an easy way to opt out. Like any other bank I'm going to go to is going to basically treat me the same, present the same obstacles and the same inconveniences that they do. But if you're Coinbase, Coinbase knows that at the end of the day, you, me, anyone who's on Coinbase, we can opt out. We can just click withdraw and we can be our own bank, right? We can self-custody. And that completely changes the thinking process, the incentives, decision-making of how they operate it. And similarly, presenting that type of optionality uh, insofar as interoperability is concerned, I think is very, very important. So not only do you get that level of flexibility, but because these modules are adaptive, because they do not 
uh, impact the interface that you're using to communicate between the chains, when there's an advance in like the state of the art of security, new modules are built for those advances. And you as the integrator, you can adapt to those new modules and you don't have to rip out your integration. You don't have to like move to the next new shiny thing. You basically go from looking at this module to that module. And so we covered Hyperlane a little bit. Now, now I got a oh, go ahead, quick go ahead. question. I got a quick question for you. So, so let let's say I'm you know I'm I uh, I'm gonna hop back to the previous slide here. So like the the interchain security module. Let's say you know I'm running my chain, you're running your chain, and I just want to be super like I'm small brain. So like my security is like a two of two multi sig or even a one of one multi sig, right? One of one, yeah. Make it the most basic. Okay. okay, okay. And then let's say your chain, like you got full on ZK aggregation, like cryptographic ZK proofs. Magic. For your module, right? And let's say we're connected via Hyperland. Is there like, is there a weakest link or strongest link type of assurance here between the two? Because I'm like very clearly using a pretty weak link for my security yeah. module. Yours is much, much stronger. So does mine get like leveled up to yours? Does yours get sort of down to, okay, okay. Let me tell you. So the way that it really works is the security module is kind of independent to what happens on that chain and anything that comes out of that chain. So like the messages that'll come out of my, you know, bulletproof ZK magic, when, wherever you accept them on your chain, any other chain that wants to accept them, it knows it's been secured by the bulletproof thing. When I, choose to accept yours from your, uh, I was going to use an unkind word, but then I will say, Be I will say cozy. You know how like when sure. you look at apartment listings and it's like, it's basically a closet, you know, that they're masquerading as an apartment, they'll call it cozy and charming. If I want to receive messages from your chain that has a cozy and charming, tiny multi-sig module, I am now accepting those. And so, you kind of get the benefit of uh, when you accept from me, you get all the good stuff. I get the disadvantage of like, if I want to do, you know, commerce with you, if I want to have stuff coming in from your side, I can only get the best that you have to offer. And in this case, unfortunately, the best you have to offer is like this cozy, presumably insecure, uh, more fraught with risk setting. So that's how it works. Got it. One of these days, we'll level up my apartment to uh, to a fully That's ZK right. magic secure. That's right. And then when you can do that, because you're already using Hyperlane, basically like that, you get, you now like, okay, now I have the magic module. It's not like you got to go and restart everything. Everything stays the same. And now you're basically going from, oh, okay, I was using the uh, cozy thing. The now I get to module. use the zk magic thing uh so next up you know this thing i was starting to tell you about earlier super lane and i would argue that to date this is the best you know example the best manifestation of hyperlane as this open framework for interoperability now at its core what super lane really is it is a super chain specific module built to serve you know, super chain member chains. And it has distinct validators and is separate from any existing uh, Hyperlane module. So to start, it's gonna have uh, this grouping of five and then grow the set from there. And that set is replicated on all the relevant super chains that want access to Superlane, such that like, you know, we avoid the case that we just talked about. That was actually like a perfect uh, you know, transition question, because what uh, Superlane kind of is, is instead of me having, right, like a super beefy setup, you having a um, more modest setup, what Velodrome's done is put together the same setup that we can both use. And that way there is no discrepancy when we move between place to place. And again, because they're all uh, super chain members, like, the weakest link basically is you either think that like OP stack is battle tested and has the good stuff or that it is not. 
Uh, and of course, I think by now, pretty clear that the answer is that um, that's pretty good. And so you get a replicated trust assumption on all the chains, regardless of your starting point. And now utilizing this module, Velodrome is also going to offer cross-chain swaps between all different Velodrome pools on the different chains that are part of the super chain. Now, to be like very clear, they could have done that without the super lane thing. They just felt that the best way, the most attractive way for them to do that is to combine these two things. All right. So think of like, you know, mode, list, base, world chain, you know, uh, uni chain when it's live pretty soon. Any other super chain that wants to uh, have this type of experience can now get that. And, you know, you're talking about really like a seamless kind of like buttery smooth uh, interoperability experience that can come in in lieu of the super chain native interoperability that we all know is coming. And that set of security can continue to grow. And I think like really cool um, thing that Velodrome is doing here is that they're utilizing their own token to incentivize uh, and encourage that security set. And so like, Superlane is really the first such like distinct, uh, what I've been calling interop zone that covers a specific ecosystem. But I'm damn sure that it won't be the last. And like, if you ask me what's so cool about these interop zones is, well, first, they can be created by anyone for any ecosystem today, right? Like, you don't have to wait. Now, they can adapt to any security controls that you'd like, just kind of like we were talking about before with the, the module concept at large. So if we stick uh, to the super lane concept, but we all know, like I was just saying, right, there is going to be a super chain native form of interoperability. So every super chain member gets access to this type of experience in the interim. Once the super chain native interoperability is live, all the apps that use super lane for their interoperability, they can upgrade to the native form of interoperability without having to reinvent anything, just going from, hey, I was pointing at super lane, now I'm gonna point at the like super chain native uh, ISM, which will use the thing that OP ends up uh, releasing and benefit from that uh, as the trust assumption for this form of interoperability. So you're getting pretty future proofed, right? Like you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. You get the best interop experience that can be had uh, within your ecosystem today. And then without any real sacrifice, you get the best one tomorrow when it's there, when it's live. And so what I'd say is, right, if like, if you're listening to us right now and you're at ZK Sync, you're at Arbitrum, you're at any one of the roll-up service providers, well, you can use Hyperlane to create the interop zone and provide that uh, silky smooth interop experience, that singular trust assumption experience, right, that's shared across all of the members in your zone for all of your users. And you can massively, massively shorten your development time by using this open framework and get to market ASAP with the best in class kind of features and really just do it, you know, in a few weeks versus several months or in some cases, even years. And you can do this with a framework that is truly open source. And best part, you never have to talk to anyone who works on Hyperlane as you do so. You might want to, but you never, ever have to. And, uh, and, and kind of last thing yeah, on this yeah, is, yeah. Of course, they can all communicate. Any one of the chains in your zone can communicate directly with any other chain outside your zone, so long as it has hyperlane, even across VM lines. To me, that's like what a truly permissionless form of interoperability looks like. Though, of course, we would have then what we talked about earlier with like the example between you and me, where those zones are not going to likely have like the same trust assumption. Got it. And, and so... Suppose I say, hey, John, you know, that sounds pretty good. I, I think I'll take that that offer of the best interrupt today and still, you know, the ability to upgrade when my native solution comes out. And and so if I take that offer and I'm in hyperlink today and then say, you know, some sometime down. The, and so, you know, I'm connected today. I'm connected in, say, Superlane. 
And then I'm also via hyperlink connected to Arbitrum Orbit, ZK Sync, and Solana, as this diagram shows. And then later on down the road, you know, Superchain comes out with their native interop experience. Would that break my connection to no. these, these other zones, Solana? So I can no. I can maintain the connectivity to these other enemy zones, if you will, through <laughs> Hyperlane. And then I can also, within my zone, I can have my native experience. Yes. The, the only two things you'll need to do is first, within your zone, basically say, hey, we were all pointing at that contract that was like the original Superlane one. And now we're going to point at this other module contract that represents the like super chain native. And then as the uh, app that accepts it, like in any of the other zones, you need to say, oh, wait. So we were all cool with accepting the first module. We're now doing the same thing. We're pointing from here to here. So those two actions and everything else stays the same. So there has to be some type of like informed consent of like, wait, they just switched something. I want to make sure that like, I don't uh, just like fall victim to uh, their choice without any consent on my side. But you do those two steps, good to go. Awesome. And so that would occur on the, on the Solana, the ZK Sync, Arbitrum yep. side. They would have to basically thumbs up this new uh, reset, uh, receiver, the thing that they're receiving is now coming from the super chain native rather than the super lane. Exactly right. Exactly right. Got it. And so, you know, so far we talked about using Hyperlane for an ecosystem like super chain, but you know, what if you're an app builder? Can you get something like this as well? And yes, yes, you can. So, uh, excuse me, I'm getting a little... Uh, little burps here. Uh, you're an asset issuer. You know, your product is a token of some sort, maybe a stable coin, LST, LRT. Again, should you put all legs, uh, all of your eggs in the basket of like some third party provider? Depending on where you're at, maybe, maybe not. Now, if you don't want to, here's how you can get around it. With Hyperlane, you have the choice to place yourself on a spectrum of how involved do you want to be in the security of your bridging? all the way from zero to 100%. In the zero case, basically what are you doing? You're just running on the existing modules. They're there, anyone can leverage them. You don't need to like ask someone, hey, can I do that? They're already running it, you go ahead, you do it. There's no harm in that, totally fine. You know, dozens of teams are doing that today. On the other end of the spectrum, you wanna be 100%, you know, meaning you want to completely insulate your product from any trust in the third party, well, you can do that too. Maybe you wanna be in the middle, right? Benefiting from some of the existing ones and bolstering them with your own, right? Still requiring your own sign off. And you can do that too. And I got a, an example that I think is a pretty great uh, story for it. So I picked here one of my favorite case studies of this design of that like in the middle design uh, that's in production. And that is Renzo, uh, specifically, Renzo's Easy ETH and uh, more recently PZ ETH use this in production, right? These are some of Renzo's most prominent assets, with hundreds of millions uh, deposited in them, and they run atop Hyperlane Rails. And because these are so consequential, right? Like the size is large, Renzo's security setup is such that they augment the existing modules with a Renzo specific module, uh, one that them and their operators are a part of. So when you're like, if you go on like renzo.superbridge.app or like renzo.hyperlane.xyz, uh, those are like front ends to move around uh, easy and easy. That transfer is validated by uh, the Renzo module or else it just cannot occur. It cannot occur, right? And, uh, you know, in the last 30 days alone, about uh, I would say a little over a billion dollars was transferred through this setup. And probably my favorite thing about it is that once the setup is there, well, like a lot of uh, companies that their business is this form of asset issuance, well, once the setup is there, it can be reused for any other asset uh, without any additional work. So take the case of Renzo, they start with easy, uh, right? Like the eigenlayer asset. 
Later on, they add PZ, which uses uh, a different network, Symbiotic. Well, they could reuse the setup for it just by saying, oh, okay, well, like the modules are there, just use those. Done, just part of the initial configuration. So all the moving parts are already there, or everything's live and operating, you just go ahead and use it. And so to me, the moral of the story is if you're someone who wants this, you can use Hyperlane to really easily achieve this and do it significantly more easily than if you were gonna start from scratch. Like I can't tell you how many times in the last four months we've run into teams that are like, are you fucking serious? We just spent like six weeks of our top engineers time trying to build like a rate limiting system, a like extra monitoring system on top of like the bridging we have from provider XYZ. And you're saying this is, this was there and you get like a, uh, both slightly exasperated, like, ah, oh, I wish I know about the center and a, well, at least I see the light at the end of the tunnel because we spent the six weeks and I don't know when the fuck that was going to end. Uh, and now like we can basically get this done in a few days. Uh, it's, it's a pretty great thing to, to witness. And so that's all that's already there, right? I mean, there's obviously a whole lot more that's already there, but like, you know, uh, I've already taken up enough of these good people's time. So we're gonna get to, uh, uh, you know, the stuff that's coming, you know, I would say saving the best for last, really. This is what's coming to the um, open framework to radically improve the experience of using it. So at a high level, what's coming in the medium term to short term, I think, you know, over the next uh, six or six months, handful of things, and they're all very related. First, economic security, right? Like putting real money on the line behind these validator attestations, right? More interestingly, this could be even used as a form of insurance, right? Say you're like, you know, uh, it's time to make that big transfer. You got you got 100K, you got to move it around and you're like scared to death. You're like, oh, I heard bridging is, is dangerous. In this uh, what's coming kind of world, it's not just that the validators who are securing your transfer are putting money on the line. That money can even be used to make up any hole that will be done as a result of like a failure on the part of a validator. And this economic security can come in the form of many assets, right? Such like if you're the app builder, you're the ecosystem, you could leverage your own token for this purpose. Um, the next thing is, and this is what we're going to talk about before we finish up here, is a security provider marketplace, right? So that the next Renzo, the next interop zone, right? Like the next super lane will have a much easier time galvanizing the um, that provisioning of security for their zone, right? Like gathering, wrangling up those uh, operators that I told you about when we were just started, right? Whether it's an app, whether it's an ecosystem, doesn't matter. Just want to make it easier for them to tap into something like this. And of course, all of this is going to be powered uh, in part by restaking networks like Eigenlayer, right? They play a material, material part in doing this. And how is this going to materialize in practice? Like, how would you actually build a security marketplace like this? And of course, it all starts with an available pool of capital to use to provide that economic security. That's why I got this uh, beautiful fountain here. Thank you, uh, Miyazaki, and thank you, Google Gemini, for the help. I asked Google Gemini to generate a uh, Miyazaki styled beautiful fountain in the middle of a town square. And I'm sorry, Miyazaki, I know you don't like AI, but you know, you're stuck in Japan, nothing you can do about it. Uh, so we start with the AVS and the AVS acts as a shelling point, a shelling point that draws operators and capital to it, which, you know, uh, metaphorically creates this fountain. So now you're the next person looking to create one of these uh, interop zones, whether it's for your app, like in the Renzo style, it's for your ecosystem, like in the uh, super lane style, you approach the fountain and you describe what you need. It's kind of like a wishing well, uh, except a lot more practical and one that actually comes true every single time. You come to the well, come to the fountain, you say, I need $150 million to secure communications between 
chains A, B, and C. Now in practice, what is this gonna look like? It's gonna look like a unified interface to express that, uh, that ask. So imagine this being a command and something like the hyperline CLI at first, eventually like a distinct you know, UI. You enter the amounts, you enter the assets that you want, the chains, the size of the set that you're looking to drop on. And of course, right? Because you got you to gotta throw a coin into the wishing wheel, right? It doesn't do it for free. You got to tell it, what are you willing to offer for it? So now, as we said before, it, there's a shelling point there. So all the operators who gather around that fountain, all of the ones who are part of that ABS, they receive that request in a programmatic fashion, thing like getting a notification. They get all the relevant info, the size, the chains, the assets, the type of the ask, and of course, what they'll get uh, for doing that. And then it's their choice to say, do I want to fill this request, right? There's lots of operators. I want to say it's over 80, might even be close to 100 uh, that are uh, related to the Hyperlane ABS today. And so, you know, do you need 80 of them to fill the request? No, you're probably not going to get eight of them. But can you get nine? Terrific. You get nine. Then once they fill it, you need a way to programmatically let the system know that they are alive, that they are operational, that they are fulfilling the request. And so in Hyperland parlance today, uh, it's called like the validator announcing. So you announce to the system that you're there. That system is then made aware of it. Those will be added to the ISM and then the thing goes live request filled. And now first, this starts with economic security and validators. But I think you can really see how this moves forward toward different forms of security that are instantiated, that are made real as Hyperlane security modules, that then any builder who is using Hyperlane can easily use for their needs, right? Like as we get more of those like bulletproof ZK magic things, well, uh, you can, you know, come to this uh, security marketplace and you can say, hey, this is what I'm willing to put on this side. I can provide this service here. Who wants it? Then you come back, the person comes back to the wishing, you're like, I wish, I would love to have CK magic. And you throw the coin in and there you go. And you're done. And you know, Robbie, that's all I got for you today. Uh, I've already taken even longer than I was planning to. Oh, uh, this is phenomenal. <laughs> I love your presentations are great. Sometimes you're you're rapping, or we're we're asking J Cole. Other times we're we're going going through and wishing wishing for different forms of economic security from the the security marketplace wishing well. Yeah, All, you know, always a pleasure. It's um, always fun. I I mean like, uh, um, someone was like, "Oh, do you wanna do you wanna go on and do this thing?" And I was like, "Well, if I have the time, I did them." Of course I wanted this thing. I like, this is fun. I have fun doing this. So I'm certainly sorry, you know, like I'm sure you've had people who come on as part of this series who are much more um, maybe formal, maybe, um, you know, more direct in there. I like to have fun. That's, just... That's what it's all about. And yeah. uh, I mean, we, we went all the way from a cozy and charming uh, security <laughs> module all the way up to a fully economically secured one with potential ZK magic. So yeah, we went, we went all, all the way here. Um, we cool. try. Jay Cole, you're the man. Thank you so much. An absolute pleasure, my friend. Anytime.